Louise, do you have a contact in, uh, in England? In England, yeah. <laughs> we had some difficulties with it in England because um, the album was in fact completed some time ago and we w it was due to be released on a, on a new independent label and a lot of things went wrong. We finally got fed up with them and um, blew the whole thing out and, we, and it's, um, it's now coming out on Jungle Records which is a, uh, a label I've worked with before. What were the problems that happened with the first time around? Well, they were t too numerous and boring to mention, really, but I mean, the, the basically, the basically, I think, the lack of experience of the people that were doing it. It was people we knew that were worked with us through uh, promotion of gigs and things. That it seemed to be okay at first, and as it went on, we got... You know, less and less um, good. So, hmm. I, I think it's probably come out this week, actually. Yeah. Yeah. It almost seems that uh, most of the people who are kind of labeled as pop rock fans, like Ian Dury, Nick Lowe, continually come out with you know, very good records, but uh, I guess yourself included. But the sales never quite uh, seem to be up to par. Well, I don't know. I mean, I suppose there's, you know, there's, there's different reasons for everybody. But I think, I think for one thing, if you're not, if you're not uh, working through major labels, you're not going to get major sales. I mean, it's just, just a simple fact of economics. They got the distribution. They got the advertising you know, the, all the various powers they have. Um, if, you know, if you've... You know, we're, typically we're people that tend to work live and, uh, you know, we have a following live that want, that want to buy our records. To, to get beyond that following, you've got to have, you know, advertising things like that which which generally aren't available to us and I, I think that's a, largely what the reason is. How Brooklyn is I mean I wonder why the major labels don't ever hook into better pub rock performers of so, <laughs> Is that a way? <laughs> It's, I mean, we, we've, uh, over this last uh, year or so, we try very hard to, to, to uh, get a deal with a major label, but they're, they're not interested. I mean, they, I think it's always the case, they're typically conservative, and they typically they will look for, they will be trying to sign things that are currently successful or things like that. They're, they're very rarely displaying imagination. It's just the kind of inertia of large corporations, I think. You know, it's just not in their nature to to try anything different. They want to go for safe bets, and, and it kind of it's great when you're on the inside of it because it, it preserves your position. When you're on the outside, it's not so good. I've been on the inside in my times. So I can't really complain. You know. <laughs> so, on, you heard a show last night. I was wondering how it feels to play here again after this full of about a year or something. We always look forward to coming. I mean, this is our full visit, and uh, it's, it's kind of turned into a kind of high spot of our year. Um, because, I suppose, well, because it's, a, it's, an, it's a, an unusual and exotic location. I mean, it's, you, you can... Uh, you can boast about it when you get home. Oh, we've been in Japan, you know. <laughs> no. But I mean, apart from things like that, it's a, it's a good audience, which we enjoy playing to. And also because uh, things like you know Smash Corporation that do put on the gigs for us are just well, aren't the best people I've ever worked with anywhere at any level. And uh, you know, you get looked after so well that, it, that it's it's just always a, a real pleasure to us to be here. So. I can say that quite genuinely. Sounds <laughs> yeah. sincere. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
when you were outside of uh, the UK and Japan? Oh yeah, we, um, I we probably spend half our time outside the UK. Uh, we, we play quite extensively in Europe, particularly uh, Scandinavia, Spain, and France. I think are the, the probably the places we spend most of our time in. But various other countries in Europe occasionally. I mean, we were in just before we just before we came here. We were in Holland, for instance, and um, as soon as we get back, we're going to Ireland to uh, do some television, some television show, and some other gigs. We we move around quite a bit. Yeah, also with you guys. You guys, how how do your records do in the other countries in Europe, the continent? I don't know, really. <laughs> I mean, all I know is how well we do really live. You know, you're much more in touch with what's happening live. I mean, you can, if you're not actually getting in the charts and uh, selling records in that kind of way, it's, very, it's hard to say how well you're doing, you know, in any particular market. I mean, I know that, for instance, when, you know, if we, when we go to Spain... We tend to do lar probably larger gigs there than anywhere else. I mean, we typically play to sort of two or three thousand people there, um, whereas it's it's a you know a smaller kind of level elsewhere. But uh, I don't know that we I don't know that we sell any more records there than anywhere else. I know we do bigger gigs there. Seems rather unique. Why do you think you go over big in Spain? Um. You excite that Latin blood. Something like that. I mean, it's certainly it's certainly good playing there. There's certainly a really good audience for rock and roll. And I, I just, I mean, ever since, uh, ever since the sort of Doctor Feelgood days, the, 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 I've just always been used to playing to rather larger audiences there. Or rather, the audiences don't seem to dwim, you know, it doesn't seem to move down that much. No, perhaps there. Uh, I've no idea why that is, really. No idea. One thing that seems to characterize your live performance is your uh, rather novel movements on stage there. Is that uh, a conscious attempt at entertaining, or is that just something you subconsciously sort of merge into? <coughs> it's, it's not something that I ever consciously contrived. And I, it's, something I, it's something I've always done. You know, kind of looking back, it's just hard to say how it evolved. I think, I think in the first place, it, it's like just, a, I don't know, kind of a physical expression of the way the music works inside me somehow. It's kind of... It's... It's sudden, it's jerky, I don't know. But um, I, I, in doing this, I think it, 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 it probably dawned on me quite early that doing that has an effect on people. I mean, to me, to me the, you know, the purpose of what I do, the music I play, is, is to excite. And I think any, anything you do that that that, uh, that 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 creates excitement is 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 a, it's also the purpose and it's it's just all it's all wrapped up in it. I mean, just it's physical music to me. It's physical. Excuse me, Kiski. I listen to other performers in the, in the same vein. I don't think you call it madness because because um, we are 
I think we're quite well aware of what we're doing. We're not we're not out of control. Um, Having slipped into an altered state there. Yeah, I think. <laughs> I mean, I think anybody can understand it. You know, if you're really digging some music, you're listening to some music, and you, and 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 people people tend to, you know, jump around when they're doing it. Uh, you know, if you, if somebody excites you, you you you'll move. I mean, even even the squarest person's going to tap their foot. It's going to make a move, and it's 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 like that. I mean, what surprises me is not so much that that we move around it's that I, you know I sometimes see other people that just seem to stand there and I don't know how they can just stand there you know I, I think that surprises me not what we do Joe, uh, display quite a bit of uh, uh, determination there when you're uh, strumming away there and you're actually drawing blood from your, your fingers <laughs> there that's uh, I guess the, the mark of a true uh, determined performer yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think I do get, I do get completely absorbed in it. I mean, I, it's hard, you know, it's hard to kind of sit down here now and and, and say what it's like. But it, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, you can, I mean, you you can literally, some, you know, like you do sometimes literally draw blood. You know, you cut your hands playing. You won't know. You'll realise later on. You won't know at the time. <laughs> um, kind of. The, the thing is, I'm actually I'm left-handed, and uh, when when I first began to le try to learn to play, I was doing it this this way around. I wasn't very good. I'm a very slow learner, and um, after I've been struggling away for some time, and everybody at school could play better than me, I decided to. To try and do it the other right-handed, I started began to play right-handed, and I could never hang on to the things, uh, so I just didn't, didn't use them. There's, there's no, I mean, there's no actual. I don't think there's any real uh, actual advantage in the technique in not using a pick. I mean, anything I can do, anything I do, I think you can do just as well with one. It's just. A, you, know, you seem to be uh, admired more as a guitarist than a vocalist. I wish that people would take more notice of your vocal prowess. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, I'm no singer. I mean, I think I can. Do, I think I can. Do, you know, the, the songs I write, I, th I write for me, and I think I can deliver them. Some of the things I write, I think I can do them probably better than anybody else could. But uh, now I'm—I mean, I, I really began as I began as a guitarist, and uh, just the circumstances uh, have led me to sort of doing uh, being a vocalist as well. I don't—I don't—I don't, I mean. Uh, When I first got going, when, you know, I first began to achieve recognition, I mean, I didn't really look at myself as much of a musician even. I looked at myself as a performer. Um, I don't know, I mean, I don't really, I don't really estimate myself in any way. I just do what I do, you know, however it comes across. I'm probably, you know, I'm, I'm, probably, a, I'm probably a better guitar player than I'm a singer. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever considered like uh, finding a, a vocalist by trade uh, to beef up the sound of the band? Do you think it would take away from it more than it would add? Uh, well, so obviously when I first began in Doctor Feelgood, the, the you know the situation was I was in a band that had a vocalist and I was the guitarist, and um, after that I think I just. The thing was, because I was writing songs and I wanted to sing them, you know, I mean, they're quite individual kind of songs. They're, you know, if they're about anything, they're about me. So I like to sing them. I worked for, uh, before this band began, uh, I, I worked for a while with uh, Lou Lewis, the harmonica player, and, he, and he, he was taking about half the vocals and that. 
I quite enjoyed doing that because he, he got a whole, you know, he got his own songs and we kind of shared things that way. But no, I mean, I like I like singing the songs. So uh, and I like having a, also. I think all of us like having a three-piece band. There's something good about a three-piece. Uh, it's so basic, and um, I think we can do everything we need to do. Pop rock thing, I guess, in the mid-70s was kind of heralded as sort of the forerunner to punk. Uh, what was the punk movement to you? Well, it's funny, when you when you start, I mean, a lot of these labels are really down to journalists more than musicians. I think that pub rock thing was particularly, because the one thing, like, pub rock was, it was labelled like that, really, it was a... It, it was more to do, it was a kind of venue rather than a kind of music. There were just gigs going in these places and, the, and more or less everybody doing those gigs was playing a different kind of music. If you looked at all the different bands that, that were uh, around at that time, they were almost all in a different kind of music. You know, there were, say, Dr. Fielder was at Rhythm and Blues and there were other bands like Brinsley Swartz and that that were more kind of rock or country rock or things like that so it, it didn't really it didn't really describe a kind of music and then the, 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 the punk thing happened you see when Dr. Fielder became successful I thought it was going to lead to a, a, a rhythm and blues what we call rhythm and blues in England really it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but a, that, that kind of rhythm and blues I thought that it was going to lead to a, a a boom in that kind of music well it didn't the next thing that happened was the punk thing uh, but I think a lot uh, that all happened when we were in fact when we were touring in America in 1976 so I didn't really see it begin but I know you know subsequently got to know a lot of these musicians and realised a lot of them had been influenced by Dr. Feelgood and I think what they what they got from Dr. Field wasn't so much the, the style or technique of music, but the energy and the simplicity, which, you know, which is the thing I really appreciated about punk music. You know, I mean, I, I liked it because of that, because I think one of the things I didn't like about the scene before, you know, when we first began, you know, and I looked around at what was happening there, was it, it was also very staid and you know, it wasn't exciting, and, and punk music was probably the opposite, I mean, there was almost no technique, I mean, some, some of the, some of it was, you know, notoriously crude musically, but the, the energy was there, which, I, you know, I think it's always, should always be there. people within any kind of movement, they're all individuals, so, I mean what they really do, you have to ask them one by one, yeah. but I think perhaps, you know, what you're getting at there is, it relates back to something I said just now, you see that the, the people that, in that pub rock thing, as I said, they were all, all playing all different kinds of music, I think that we were generally all experienced musicians to one degree or another. I mean, uh, some of us, some of the musicians on the pub rock thing were fairly well known. They'd got reputation. Some, like, like uh, Dr. Feelgood, were uh, uh, completely unknown. We'd never done anything professionally before. But, but you know, we'd played quite a lot. We'd learned to play, and we'd, we were com all committed in one way or another to our styles. The punk rockers were largely very young, very new, and just going in with more or less nothing but enthusiasm. Now, obviously, uh, 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 a lot of them fell by the wayside. Um, the ones that did have something, 
continue now because they were new like anybody you know when you're new you're starting something and you you'll find your way to different things I think that's what happened it's simply a matter of you know we some of us already found our way when we you know and, and the, the punk rockers had them, but that's what it was Well, I think I think the the the, the ones that, that impressed me most were the Clash. I mean, first of all, they they. You know, they were just more or less this pure punk thing, just this kind of thrash music, you know, with a, you know, a lot of energy. And I quite like the fact that there were ideas in their songs. Although at first I thought, you know, I found them pretty primitive musically. But as as they went on, I think, you know, they and they started absorbing different influences. I mean, I was I was very impressed with some of the some of the stuff that they come out with later on. You know, and to me they. They, I think they were the most impressive example of something developing. Yeah, the Clash. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned the Clash, and they did adopt you know, other styles like uh, reggae or mm -hmm. that type of thing. Have you ever considered that type of thing in your own case? Uh, mixing and matching outside styles in that way? Uh, No, I, I, I don't, it's so hard to, to kind of say what, what goes on when you're thinking of, you know, I mean I have a certain idea about music, you know, and a, a certain, I know what it was that kind of excited me and my, and and just a certain feeling that, that made me want to play the way I play and I found it in what I called rhythm and blues and it, it's that that's still the thing to me and and uh, I think it, there, you know I well, that's the music I like to play I like this there's a lot of other things that I like to listen to you know that and I think that they all creep in here and there. But I've, n I've never consciously thought, I want to change, or I, I want to bring this or that in. If, if something, if a slight, if, if you may pick up an echo from reggae or soul music or something here and there, you, you, you'd be aware of that when you're writing a song or something. But I never consciously think I want to take a direction or something I just always do my thing <laughs> mm. what the, the solo guy yeah. he's somebody that they, they went out uh, yeah. Me, I, when, <laughs> I always go back to my room and go to bed, right? And I, 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 I'm not a socialising person. The others, the night before, the others all went out um, on the town and they saw him playing and they liked it. So they, they asked him to come along. That was the first time I'd, I'd seen him. That, yeah. They just happened to see him playing the night before and asked him to come along. You just know the big guy in yeah, our, you know, performance is okay, it's the best with Husky Woods and Bills, and uh, you're saying that your approach to rhythm and blues is not very, it's not as slavish as, say, his approach to blues. Yeah. You tend to take your own approach. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, um, I thought he did, I, you know, I thought he was good at what he did, but as you say, I mean, he's playing blues, you know, he's like... T uh, Playing in that in that style, you know those, those things that have been recorded in another time, another place by different people. I mean, I love the blues, and it, you know, I can remember, you know, when I was a teenager, and the first time I heard blues music, and it just—that's the thing about it. See, it's just it communicates. It's such a it so powerfully, and what and you think, well, why? Why should a teenage 
white kid in England get off on this music that black people in America were doing probably 10, 20 years before. There's something about it. There's also something about it that is unique to the circumstances it came from, and I've always been realised that, and I've always realised that I could never play the blues, you know, I mean, love it as much as I do, I could never play the blues, but because it, it's something about it gets to me, there must be something about it I can reflect, and, I, and uh, you know, when we were saying earlier about, you know, what influences on my music and things like that, I always like to... So I'm thinking that what I do is somehow true to that feeling, that that is something very intangible. But that that if that that thing should be in it, it should twang in it somewhere. But it's got to be something also to do with me that I understand. I mean, I've never ridden on a freight train or anything like that, you know. But <laughs> right, I never picked any cotton at all, right? But. Um, you know, but I, I still feel the same way any other human feels, and I just, you know, got to try and say what I feel like from where I am. Mm. Yeah, I'm just for a, a period there, I guess, uh, when you released, when Dr. Sylvia released Stupidity, you guys were kind of uh, riding behind the charts there. Um, do you keep up with the. Uh, <laughs> Music. Oh, I'm afraid I don't. Um, uh, I'm every now and then, you know, we have this uh, pro television program in England called Top of the Pops, where you know it's a chart show. Every now and then, I kind of watch it. To, I think I must watch it and just sort of be in touch. And it, I tell you, it just bores me shitless. It's 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 awful. It's bloody terrible. And I, you know, and sometimes I sit and think, well, is this just a sort of me being, you know, like reactionary sour grapes? Or but it's not really because um, I don't I don't um, I don't feel these people are doing me out of anything. Or I, but I just, I just don't, they, they certainly don't excite me. And, uh, and then when I even know, I even sort of know some of these people personally as well, and I, they still don't excite me, you know, musically. So, is anybody around in the, the charts these days? You know, you just putting out music that's not really marginal. I don't even know what's in the charts at the minute. I, I mean, sometimes you get you get bands that are really good, like Talking Heads or someone, and they have a hit, and they're great band, and great music, you know, but. That are not what we're talking about, are they? I mean, at the minute, it's a, there's just so much. I'll tell you what, there's so much of these synthesizers and so much music now that's made by machines, and that I really detest. I absolutely despise and detest it. And anybody that can, anybody that can stand there and, and with one finger on some stupid silicon chip, and you know, and and. Any, I don't know where people waste their money on it. It's beyond me. I don't know. What do you listen to at home? Sometimes I have to listen to some of that because I've got children. You know? Oh, no, right. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I listen to things. I mean, I love Bob Dylan. You know, I always have, and I still, it still sounds great to me. And of course, all the blues things and. Uh, Oh, so you know, you, as the years go by, you, you kind of go in different scenes. You pick up different things that are great. I mean, Jimi Hendrix is great. Uh, I like Neil Young. You know, I like. I don't know. I like Django Reinhardt. You know, I mean, just. Um, I like rhythm and blues best of all. Uh -huh. <laughs> when you say rhythm and blues, what exactly are you referring to? I'm totally baffled. Uh -huh. What are you exactly referring to by rhythm and blues? Mm, probably I mean anything I like. Don't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, there's the, the kind of rhythm and blues that what we call British rhythm and blues is derived from is, is sort of like, well, you got the, you know, like Chicago blues and all that sort of muddy waters oh, and these yeah. kind of people, you know, yeah, urban blues music. But I mean, it, it, it goes through to soul music, you know, and, uh, and 
stuff like that, you know. I don't know. Um, well, that's the biggest transition it made. So it was, yeah. You know, by way of the impressions. Yeah, yeah. It goes. I mean, it's, it's a very wide range of music. Yeah. Though, you know, it goes from very, 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 very sophisticated stuff to, to the, you know, like something like John Lee Hooker that's almost primitive but still marvelous to me. You know, look. But I mean, I don't. Know, a lot of the time, I read books. You know, I don't listen to music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People always think you spend your life kind of. As, as a musician, you know, you're always listening to music. Or the, you know, we do do other things as well. I think most musicians do, I find. They're almost listening to yeah. music. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they've got, they're genuinely following the charts too, I suppose. Yeah. But I guess most of the people that come here tend to be people who are in the charts. Yeah. That's why they come Yeah. 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 So it does. I feel resentment that... If there was any justice in this world, then I would never have got anywhere. <laughs> so, you know, I don't really know. Out, <laughs> no, no, I think it's true. I mean, I because you can look at it both ways. I'm, I've seen people. I'm, I know there are people that that have got more in there than I've got who, who are unknown. You know, and. Uh, that's just the way it goes. I think you, if you spend your time getting upset because um, some kids are, you know, getting very rich and, and getting lots of girls and that, then you're just being silly. You're just causing grief for yourself. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously, you know, any any musician would love to have his records at the top of the charts and, and sell out. Can't.